Section 10 of An Account of Egypt by Herodotus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Account of Egypt by Herodotus. Section 10. Such is the story which they tell. But as for Semeticos, he was king over Egypt for four and fifty years, of which for thirty years save one he was sitting before Azotos, a great city of Syria, besieging it until at last he took it. And this Azotos of all cities about which we have knowledge held out for the longest time under a siege. The son of Semeticos was Nekos, and he became king of Egypt. This man was the first who attempted the channel leading to the Erythrean Sea, which Darius the Persian afterwards completed. The length of this is a voyage of four days, and in breadth it was so dug that two triremes could go side by side driven by oars, and the water is brought into it from the Nile. The channel is conducted a little above the city of Bubastis, by Petumos, the Arabian city, and runs into the Erythrean Sea and it is dug first along those parts of the plain of Egypt which lie towards Arabia, just above which run the mountains which extend opposite Memphis, where are the stone quarries. Along the base of these mountains the channel is conducted from west to east for a great way, and after that it is directed towards a break in the hills, and tends from these mountains toward the noonday and the south wind to the Arabian Gulf. Now in the place where the journey is least and shortest from the northern to the southern sea, which is also called Erythrean, that is, from Mount Kazion, which is the boundary between Egypt and Syria, the distance is exactly a thousand furlongs to the Arabian Gulf. But the channel is much longer, since it is more winding, and in the reign of Nekos there perished while digging it twelve myriads of the Egyptians. Now Nekos ceased in the midst of his digging, because the utterance of an oracle impeded him, which was to the effect that he was working for the barbarian, and the Egyptians call all men barbarians who do not agree with them in speech. Thus having ceased from the work of the channel, Nekos betook himself to raging wars, and triremes were built by him, some for the northern sea and others in the Arabian Gulf for the Erythrean Sea. And of these the sheds are still to be seen. These ships he used when he needed them, and also on land Nekos engaged battle at Magdalos with the Syrians, and conquered them. And after this he took Cadutus, which is a great city of Syria, and the dress which he wore when he made these conquests he dedicated to Apollo, sending it to Branchidae of the Milesians. After this, having reigned in all sixteen years, he brought his life to an end and handed on the kingdom to Samus his son. While this Samus was king of Egypt, there came to him men sent by the Eleans, who boasted that they ordered the contest at Olympia in the most just and honorable manner possible, and thought that not even the Egyptians, the wisest of men, could find out anything besides to be added to their rules. Now when the Eleasans came to Egypt, and said that for which they had come, then this king called together those of the Egyptians, who were reputed the wisest. And when the Egyptians had come together, they heard the Eleans tell of all that which it was their part to do in regard to the contest. And when they had related everything, they said that they had come to learn in addition anything which the Egyptians might be able to find out besides, which was juster than this. They then, having consulted together, asked the Eleans whether their own citizens took part in the contest, and they said that it was permitted to any one who desired it to take part in the contest, upon which the Egyptians said that in so ordering the games they had wholly missed the mark of justice, for it could not be but that they would take part with the man of their own state if he was contending, and so act unfairly to the stranger. But if they really desired, as they said, to order the games justly, and if this was the cause for which they had come to Egypt, they advised them to order the contest so as to be for strangers alone to contend in, and that no Eleans should be permitted to contend. Such was the suggestion made by the Egyptians to the Eleans. When Samus had been king of Egypt for only six years, and had made an expedition to Ethiopia, and immediately afterwards had ended his life, Aprius, the son of Samus, received the kingdom in succession. This man came to be the most prosperous of all the kings up to that time except only his forefather Semeticos, and he reigned five and twenty years during which he led an army against Sidon, and fought a sea fight with the king of Tyre. Since, however, it was fated that evil should come upon him, it came by occasion of a matter which I shall relate at greater length in the Libyan history, and at present but shortly. 
Aprius, having set a great expedition against the Carinians, met with correspondingly great disaster, and the Egyptians, considering him to blame for this, revolted from him, supposing that Aprius had with forethought sent them out to evident calamity, in order, as they said, that there might be a slaughter of them, and he might the more securely rule over the other Egyptians. Being indignant at this, both these men who had returned from the expedition and also the friends of those who had perished made revolt openly. Hearing this, Aprius sent to them Amasis, to cause them to cease by persuasion. And when he had come and was seeking to restrain the Egyptians as he was speaking and telling them not to do so, one of the Egyptians stood up behind him and put a helmet upon his head, saying as he did so that he put it on to crown him king. And to him this that was done was in some degree not unwelcome, as he proved by his behavior. For as soon as the revolted Egyptians had set him up as king, he prepared to march against Aprius. And Aprius, hearing this, sent to Amasis, one of the Egyptians who were about his own person, a man of reputation whose name was Paterbemus, enjoining him to bring Amasis alive into his presence. When this Paterbemus came and summoned Amasis, the latter, who happened to be sitting on horseback, lifted up his leg and behaved in an unseemly manner, bidding him take that back to Aprius. Nevertheless, they say, Paterbemus made demand of him that he should go to the king, seeing that the king had sent to summon him. And he answered him that he had for some time past been preparing to do so, and that Aprius would have no occasion to find fault with him, for he would both come himself and bring others with him. Then Paterbemus, both perceiving his intention from that which he said, and also seeing his preparations, departed in haste, desiring to make known as quickly as possible to the king the things which were being done. And when he came back to Aprius, not bringing Amasis, the king paying no regard to that which he said, but being moved by violent anger, ordered his ears and his nose to be cut off. And the rest of the Egyptians, who still remained on his side, when they saw the man of most repute among them thus suffering shameful outrage, waited no longer, but joined the others in revolt, and delivered themselves over to Amasis. Now he had about him Carian and Ionian mercenaries to the number of thirty thousand, and his royal palace was in the city of Sais, of great size and worthy to be seen. So Aprius and his army were going against the Egyptians and Amasis, and those with him were going against the mercenaries, and both sides came to the city of Momemphis, and were about to make trial of one another in fight. Now of the Egyptians there are seven classes, and of these one class is called that of the priests, and another that of the warriors, while the others are the cowherds, swineherds, shopkeepers, interpreters, and boatmen. This is the number of classes of the Egyptians, and their names are given them from the occupations which they follow. Of them the warriors are called Calasirians and Hermotibians, and they are of the following districts, for all Egypt is divided into districts. The districts of the Hermotibians are those of Busiris, Sais, Chemis, Pepremus, the island called Prosopitus, and the half of Natho. Of these districts are the Hermotibians, who reach when most numerous the number of sixteen myriads. Of these not one has been learned anything of handicraft, but they are given up to war entirely. Again the districts of the Calasirians are those of Thebes, Ubastus, Aptus, Tanis, Mendes, Sevenutos, Athribus, Farbathos, Tumus, Onupus, Anutis, Mycephorus, this last is on an island opposite to the city of Bubastus. These are the districts of the Calasirians, and they reached when most numerous to the number of five and twenty myriads of men. Nor is it lawful for these any more than for the others to practice any craft, but they practice that which has to do with war only, handing down the tradition from father to son. Now whether the Hellenes have learnt this also from the Egyptians I am not able to say for certain, since I see that the Thracians also, and Scythians, and Persians, and Lydians, and almost all the barbarians, esteem those of their citizens who learn the arts, and the descendants of them, as less honourable than the rest, while those who have got free from all practice of manual arts are accounted noble, and especially those who are devoted to war. However that may be, the Hellenes have all learnt this, and especially the Lacedaemonians, but the Corinthians least of all cast slight upon those who practice handicraft. The following privilege was specially granted to this class and to none others of the Egyptians except the priests. That is to say, each man had twelve yokes of land specially granted to him free from imposts. 
Now the yoke of land measures a hundred Egyptian cubits every way, and the Egyptian cubit is, as it happens, equal to that of Samos. This, I say, was a special privilege granted to all, and they also had certain advantages in turn and not the same men twice, that is to say, a thousand of the Calisarians and a thousand of the Hermitibians acted as bodyguard to the king during each year, and these had besides their yokes of land an allowance given them for each day of five pounds weight of bread to each man, and two pounds of beef, and four half pints of wine. This was the allowance given to those who were serving as the king's bodyguard for the time being. So when a Prius leading his foreign mercenaries and Amasis at the head of the whole body of the Egyptians and their approach to one another had come to the city of Momemphis, they engaged in battle. And although the foreign troops fought well, yet being much inferior in number they were worsted by reason of this. But a Prius is said to have supposed that not even a god would be able to cause him to cease from his rule. So firmly did he think that it was established. In that battle, then, I say, he was worsted and being taken alive was brought away to the city of Sais, to that which had formerly been his own dwelling, but from thenceforth was the palace of Amasis. There for some time he was kept in the palace, and Amasis dealt well with him, but at last, since the Egyptians blamed him, saying that he act not rightly in keeping alive him who was the greatest foe, both to themselves and to him, therefore he delivered a Prius over to the Egyptians, and they strangled him and after that buried him in the burial place of his fathers. This is in the temple of Athena, close to the sanctuary, on the left hand as you enter. Now the men of Sais buried all those of this district who had been kings within the temple. For the tomb of Amasis also, though it is further from the sanctuary than that of Aprius and his forefathers, yet this too is within the court of the temple, and it consists of a colonnade of stone of great size, with pillars carved to imitate date-palms, and otherwise sumptuously adorned, and within the colonnade are double doors, and inside the doors a sepulchral chamber. Also at Sais there is the burial place of him who I account it not pious to name in connection with such a matter, which is in the temple of Athena behind the house of the goddess, stretching along the whole wall of it, and in the sacred enclosure stand great obelisks of stone, and near them is a lake adorned with an edging of stone, and fairly made in a circle, being in size, as it seemed to me, equal to that which is called the round pool in Delos. On this lake they perform by night the show of his sufferings, and this the Egyptians call mysteries. Of these things I know more fully in detail how they take place, but I shall leave this unspoken, and of the mystic rites of Demeter, which the Hellenes call Desmoria, of these also, although I know I shall leave unspoken, all except so much as piety permits me to tell. The daughters of Danaos were they who brought this rite out of Egypt, and taught it to the women of the Pelasgians. Then afterwards, when all the inhabitants of Peloponnese were driven out by the Dorians, the rite was lost, and only those who were left behind of the Peloponnesians and not driven out, that is to say the Arcadians, preserved it. Aprius having thus been overthrown, Amasis became king, being of the district of Sais, and the name of the city whence he was is Siof. Now at the first the Egyptians despised Amasis and held him in no great regard, because he had been a man of the people, and was of no distinguished family. But afterwards Amasis won them over to himself by wisdom and not willfulness. Among innumerable other things of price which he had, there was a foot-basin of gold in which both Amasis himself and all his guests were wont always to wash their feet. This he broke up, and of it he caused to be made the image of a god, and set it up in the city where it was most convenient. And the Egyptians went continually to visit the image and did great reverence to it. Then Amasis, having learnt that which was done by the men of the city, called together the Egyptians and made known to them the matter, saying that the image had been produced from the foot-basin into which formerly the Egyptians used to vomit and make water and in which they washed their feet, whereas now they did to it great reverence. And just so he continued had he himself now feared as the foot-basin, for though formerly he was a man of the people, yet now he was their king, and he bade them accordingly honour him and have regard for him. In such manner he won the Egyptians to himself, so that they consented to be his subjects, and his ordering of affairs was this. In the early morning and until the time of the filling of the market he did with a good will the business which was brought before him. But after this he passed the time in drinking and in jesting at his boon companions, and was frivolous and playful. And his friends, being troubled at it, admonished him in some such words as these. 
O king, thou dost not rightly govern thyself in thus letting thyself descend to behaviour so trifling, for thou oughtest rather to have been sitting throughout the day stately upon a stately throne and administering thy business, and so the Egyptians would have been assured that they were ruled by a great man, and thou wouldest have had a better report. But as it is, thou art acting by no means in a kingly fashion. And he answered them thus, They who have bows stretch them at such time as they wish to use them, and when they have finished using them they loose them again, for if they were stretched tight always they would break, so that the men would not be able to use them when they needed them. So also is the state of man. If he should always be in earnest and not relax himself for sport at the due time, he would either go mad or be struck with stupor before he was aware, and knowing this well I distribute a portion of the time to each of the two ways of living. Thus he replied to his friends. It is said, however, that Amasis, even when he was in a private station, was a lover of drinking and of jesting, and not at all seriously disposed, and whenever his means of livelihood failed him through his drinking and luxurious living, he would go about and steal, and they from whom he stole would charge him with having their property, and when he denied it would bring him before the judgment of an oracle whenever there was one in their place, and many times he was convicted by the oracles, and many times he was absolved. And then when finally he became king he did as follows, as many of the gods as had absolved him and pronounced him not to be a thief, to their temples he paid no regard nor gave anything for the further adornment of them, nor even visited them to offer sacrifice, considering them to be worth nothing and to possess lying oracles. But as many as had convicted him of being a thief, to these he paid very great regard, considering them to be truly gods, and to present oracles which did not lie. First in Sais he built and completed for Athena a temple gateway which is a great marvel, and he far surpassed herein all who had done the like before, both in regard to height and greatness. So large are the stones, and of such quality. Then secondly he dedicated great colossal statues and man-headed sphinxes very large, and for restoration he caused to be brought from the stone quarries which are opposite Memphis, others of very great size from the city of Elephantine distant a voyage of not less than twenty days from Sais, And of them all I marvel most at this, namely a monolith chamber which he brought from the city of Elephantine, and they were three years engaging in bringing this, and two thousand men were appointed to convey it, who all were of the class of boatmen. Of this house the length outside is one and twenty cubits, the breadth is fourteen cubits, and the height eight. These are the measures of the monolith house outside, but the length inside is eighteen cubits and five-sixths of a cubit, the breadth twelve cubits, and the height five cubits. This lies by the side of the entrance to the temple, for within the temple they did not draw it, because, as it is said, while the house was being drawn along, the chief artificer of it groaned aloud, seeing that much time had been spent and he was wearied by the work. And Amasis took it to heart as a warning, and did not allow them to draw it further onwards. Some say, on the other hand, that a man was killed by it, of those who were heaving it with levers, and that it was not drawn in for that reason. Amasis also dedicated, in all the other temples which were of repute, works which are worth seeing for their size, and among them also at Memphis the colossal statue, which lies on its back in front of the temple of Hephaestos whose length is five and seventy feet, and on the same base made of the same stone are set two colossal statues, each of twenty feet in length, one on this side and the other on that side of the large statue. There is also another of stone of the same size in Sais, lying in the same manner as that at Memphis. Moreover, Amasis was he who built and finished for Isis her temple at Memphis, which is of great size and very worthy to be seen. In the reign of Amasis it is said that Egypt became more prosperous than at any other time before, both in regard to that which comes to the land from the river, and in regard to that which comes from the land to its inhabitants, and that at this time the inhabited towns in it numbered all twenty thousand. It was Amasis too who established the law that every year each one of the Egyptians should declare to the ruler of his district from what source he got his livelihood. And if any man did not do this, or did not make declaration of an honest way of living, he should be punished with death. Now Solon the Athenian received from Egypt this law, and had it enacted for the Athenians, and they have continued to observe it, since it is a law with which none can find fault. Moreover, 
Amasis became a lover of the Hellenes, and besides other proof of friendship which he gave to several among them, he also granted to the city of Nacratus for those of them who came to Egypt to dwell in, and to those who did not desire to stay, but who made voyages thither, he granted portions of land to set up altars and make sacred enclosures for their gods. Their greatest enclosure, and that one which has most name and is most frequented, is called the Hellenion, and thus it was established by the following cities in common, of the Ionians, Chios, Teos, Phocatia, Clazomenae, of the Dorians, Rhodes, Cnidos, Halicarnassus, Phasilus, and of the Aeolians, Mytilene alone. To these belongs this enclosure, and these are the cities which appoint superintendents of the port, and all other cities which claim a share in it, are making a claim without any right. Besides this, the Aganetans established on their own account a sacred enclosure dedicated to Zeus, the Samians one to Hera, and the Milesians one to Apollo. Now in old times Nacratus alone was an open trading place and no other place in Egypt, and if any one came to any other of the Nile mouths, he was compelled to swear that he came not thither of his own free will, and when he had thus sworn his innocence, he had to sail with his ship to the Canobic mouth, or if it were not possible to sail by reason of contrary winds, then he had to carry his cargo round the head of the delta in boats to Nacratus. Thus highly was Nacratus privileged. Moreover, when the Amphictyons had let out the contract for building the temple which now exists at Delphi, agreeing to pay a sum of three hundred talents, for the temple which formerly stood there had been burnt down of itself, it fell to the share of the people of Delphi to provide the fourth part of the payment, and accordingly the Delphians went about to various cities and collected contributions. And when they did this they got from Egypt as much as from any place, for Amasis gave them a thousand talents weight of alum, while the Hellenes who dwelt in Egypt gave them twenty pounds of silver. Also with the people of Carina, Amasis made an agreement for friendship and alliance, and he resolved too to marry a wife from thence, whether because he desired to have a wife of Hellenic race, or apart from that on account of friendship for the people of Carina. However that may be, he married, some say, the daughter of Batos, others of Arcasilos, and others of Critobulos, a man of repute among the citizens, and her name was Ladike. Now whenever Amasis lay with her he found himself unable to have intercourse, but with his other wives he associated as he was wont. And as this happened repeatedly, Amasis said to his wife, whose name was Ladike, Woman, thou hast given me drugs, and thou shalt surely perish more miserably than any other. Then Ladike, when by her denials Amasis was not at all appeased in his anger against her, made a vow in her soul to Aphrodite, that if Amasis on that night had intercourse with her, seeing that this was the remedy for her danger, she would send an image to be dedicated to her at Carina. And after the vow immediately Amasis had intercourse, and from thenceforth whenever Amasis came in to her, he had intercourse with her, and after this he became very greatly attached to her. And Ladike paid the vow that she had made to the goddess, for she had an image made and sent it to Carina, and it is still preserved even to my own time, standing with its face turned away from the city of the Carinians. This Ladike Cambyses, having conquered Egypt and heard from her who she was, sent back unharmed to Carina. Amasis also dedicated offerings in Hellas, first at Carina, an image of Athena covered over with gold and a figure of himself, made like by painting. Then in the temple of Athena at Lindos two images of stone and a corslet of linen worthy to be seen, and also at Samos two wooden figures of himself dedicated to Hera, which were standing even to my own time, in the great temple behind the doors. Now at Samos he dedicated offerings because of the guest friendship between himself and Polycrates, the son of Aeaches, at Lindos for no guest friendship, but because the temple of Athena at Lindos is said to have been founded by the daughters of Danaos, who had touched land there at the time when they were fleeing from the sons of Aegyptos. These offerings were dedicated by Amasis, and he was the first of men who conquered Cyprus and subdued it, so that it paid him tribute. End of section 10 End of an account of Egypt by Herodotus, translated by George Campbell Macaulay Recording by Philip Gould